Look at Tennessee. Look at Good morning, Sivling. Welcome to church. Good to see everybody here today. My name is Ron Westman. I am your worship pastor. Let me call you to worship from Colossians 3.16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your heart to God. So church, let us do that. As we sing today, sing with gratitude in your hearts. We have so many things to be thankful for. Just think of those as we sing psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. And as we do that, those songs can also teach. They can also admonish one another with wisdom. And why do we do all this? Why do we sing? Why do we worship? Well, because God commanded us to, but so that also according to this, so that the message of Christ can dwell in your hearts richly. All right? Let us all stand up as we sing. Bless that wonderful name. Heavenly Father, this is not one of the easiest texts in Scripture, um, but God, it, it sits as a part of your grand design, as a part of your big picture. So help us to see our part in the big picture, that there, there is a foundation of grace at the foot of the cross securing our part in the building up of your kingdom that we should steward with joy. Help us to see the, the individuals and, and their contributions 
as an act of worship they, that matters to you. And allow that to affect our identity, our priorities, and our sense of joy. God, give us grace to understand your word this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a baseball. The game of baseball is uh, one where you have the batter who is pitched the ball. And the batter is supposed to knock the ball into the field, allowing them to touch the first, second, third base and to run back home to score right where they started. The opposing team is spread throughout the field. They are supposed to retrieve the ball and use it to stop the batter from advancing through the bases or better yet, get the batter out so they cannot score. If the team is going to work, then the individuals on the team have to start by keeping their eyes on on the ball. Right, I got three kids in baseball season right now, so keep your eyes on the ball. It's a lot uh, of times that comes out of my mouth. You may have all of the ability, but if your focus is on other things instead of the ball, then it's a waste. In Nehemiah 3, we see a team who kept their eyes on the ball. What is that? That's God's kingdom, which is built through the teamwork of the church. And if you claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I hope that last week and today is going to burden you off the bleachers onto the field with his team. So, who is involved in the project? I'm not going to profile everybody listed here. That would take a very long time and uh, is definitely for a a nerdy group of people, um, which I would find a lot of that interesting. But what you need to know, there's a lot of people involved in this. 38 by my count, you are free to recount, uh, individuals, and then 14 groups of people are listed as involved as well. This was a massive undertaking. You're going to build the walls, the towers, the gates. You know, who are you going to get to do that type of work? You're going to get masons. You're going to get carpenters. You're going to maybe get some blacksmiths. But who do we have listed in the text by occupation? You look at the first verse. What are those guys in in 3-1 there? They're priests. Are they qualified to build? I mean, sure, they're good at, like, reading the the scrolls and and God's word, and they're good at doing temple things, but, I mean, would those soft hands know how to swing a hammer? And then men of Jericho? I mean, you guys are, like, 15 miles away from Jerusalem. They didn't have, like, Uber or a bus or things back then. Now, you think, okay, Jericho, the battle with Joshua, that's long ago that happened, and that area has been assumed into part of the region for for a long time now. But these guys are going to have to walk 15 miles from home, basically set up camp to live, temporary living quarters for this whole project to get done. Did they know how long that was going to get done when they committed to being a part of this? Well, instead of playing in the dirt or picking daisies, they're keeping their eye on the ball. You know what I mean? Check out verse 5. We got these Tekoites. Okay, these guys were five miles south of Bethlehem. Now, you've heard of Bethlehem. Uh, it's a little bit ways, uh, you know, not too far um, from Jerusalem. You could, like, do a, a Google Maps, like, you know, how long would it take to drive from Bethlehem to Jerusalem? Not too long. But the Tekoites are about five miles south of them, and they are not listed in Ezra 2, which is another super long list of all the people who returned from Persia to Jerusalem. So if they're not listed there, it likely means they were never deported. They were probably too far outside of Nebuchadnezzar's smash and grab zone, so they were never deported. Okay, but... Even though they had been in the region all of this time, they still identified with God's people here. Not just in cheap talk, 
No, they identified with their time and their energy, all of them except the nobles among them. Now, Nehemiah is being very sarcastic here because this word nobles literally means majestic or exalted ones. He's basically saying, you are so exalted, you can't even stoop to bend your neck to get down and serve the Lord. Well, they weren't keeping their eye on the ball. They had another kingdom that they, they were looking at. Now, there's a lot of political games that are happening in this time, and maybe the nobles had connections with leadership in Egypt, and they were discouraging them from being a part of the building of the wall. We, we don't know, but either way, they had their priorities mixed up. They weren't focused on the ball. They were too important to be bothered with the things of God. And God's people would be wise to see this as a warning to be off the bleachers and on the field. Did the walls and the gates and the towers, did, did it need the nobles to be built? No. The nobles needed to be a part of building it, though. You know the difference there? Look, if you s decide, I'm just going to drop out, not be a part of church anymore, okay, the church is still going to continue. It's still going to go. All right? Well, what if all of us stop coming here? Okay. Well, then if Shively drops out, the church in America is still going to continue. Well, what if everybody stops doing okay. Like, then the church at large is going to continue, okay? God, he's building, he's building it up. Um, if, I didn't get into this last week, but if current trajectories continue, as they, they have been for the last 10 years or so, before I likely die, and people younger than me die, we are going to see the day when Africa is sending out more missionaries than America, Okay, God, his church is going to be used to build up his kingdom. And where he is, where he is sought, where people are saying, I'm on the team, put me to work. Like he's moving, he is at work. All right, back to our text. What other occupations are listed? In verse eight, we've got goldsmiths and perfumers. What do they know about building a wall? You know, you guys deal with the, the high-end stuff and, you know, your little tinker tools and your little mixtures. And, okay, but does God call the equipped or does God equip the called? And if you didn't tune out in the reading by verse 12, you're going to notice two things about Halawash. Number one, he's ruler of half the district of Jerusalem. Now, if you're a ruler, doesn't that mean you have the authority to tell other people to do the hard work? I, I worked hard, I got up top, so I didn't have to do the difficult part. Well, it's the opposite in God's kingdom. Because my king bent down and washed some ugly feet so that those disciples would know what kind of kingdom they are called to be a part of. All right, secondly... This guy's daughters were helping build the wall. Like, I mean, talk about a guy that, that knows how to say, like, equip people around them. You know, and, and that's not a, a thing that you would see women doing in that day. But they're, they're like, we're going to be a part of this. This is a team effort. We're jumping on board with this here. Verse 14. Look at that. I mean, you, you think, okay, what did, what did Melchijah do to get put on the dung gate? Um, like, that had a name for a reason, Okay. And then also notice, he was ruler of a district. He had some authority to pass this off. But in the heat and stench, this soldier built the dung gate. And he could probably command anything he wanted in his district after that was on his resume. We got a couple more local rulers here uh, submitting to build. Then verse 17, you got the Levites. Likely there's some musicians in the mix of them. Temple workers, they're committing to build. You know, was the wall perfectly even and straight? Could a, could a mason show up and start critiquing all of the little areas and the way they should have positioned things and how much uh, of this material they should? Probably. But these guys were like, we're jumping in. We're on board. We're committing to this. 
Now the Nehemiah in verse 16 is different than the author because they both have different dads. If you look at Nehemiah 1.1, 1, 1, he's the son of a different guy than Nehemiah uh, 3.16 here. Um, just pointing that out. But then finally, the chapter ends with more goldsmiths and merchants. All right, these merchants, they're not selling. They're not making money during this time. This is, this is a sacrificial act of worship to be involved in the building up of God's kingdom here. Now, do we have any carpenters or masons who are listed? Nope. Nobody who we would really consider qualified. But that's just who Jesus is accused of using, of being with, right? Your teacher eats with sinners and tax collectors. He eats with, he spends time with the un qualified. And that's just what God's church is made up of, the unqualified who are only qualified by trusting in Jesus Christ. God's kingdom is built through the teamwork of this church. So what did they do? All right, I think, okay, what did they do? Well, they, oh, I lost my mic here. Uh, get a camera zoom in on that if, if possible. Um, we've got uh, a Ragsdale Design Incorporated gave us a little Lego model mock-up of Jerusalem here. Um, what, what they did, okay, yeah, they built walls and, and, and gates and stuff, and congratulations, that, that's brilliant. Uh, but let's get a little deeper here, okay? This is for, for the visual people. Jerusalem uh, was larger on the northern section surrounding the temple, and then it, it would come out a little, a little bit further, but you'd have, um, you'd have the city then sloping down to the south. So this is the northern end here. And then you got the southern end um, over here. And as you, you see how uh, Nehemiah plays this out, he starts listing in the northern section, you know, with the, the gates that the, the priests worked on. And then he goes around to the, the western section and then the southern section, which is like the dung gate there. Everything kind of flowed down there. Um, and then you got a bunch of gates along the, the eastern side. The Kidron Valley would have been over here where uh, Jesus you know, back in the New, New Testament, came over for uh, Good Friday. Um, but then you had, you had the, the water source here, so that's why you had a lot of the, uh, the fountain gate, the water gate, all those on the, the eastern section there. So I leave that up there. You can come look at it uh, after, afterwards if you want. Uh, but Nehemiah was a smart guy in the way that he organized this because he often had people building near their house. You look through the texts and you... Uh, there's a, a few things, you know, that, that repeat uh, quite a bit in this section, but near their house was one of them, okay? So what did the priests work on in verse 1 there? They worked on the sheep gate. Why was it called the sheep gate? Because it's where you brought the sheep through to be slaughtered for the sacrifice of their sins. So they, this was like right out the front door of the temple. They realized, like, this is more than just something physical, this is, this is a spiritual act of worship here. And so what did the priests do? They consecrated it. They said, we want this to be used to build up God's people. All right. Then um, you can see in verse 10, 23, 26, 28, every, people were building near their homes. Uh, think about it. If the city gets attacked again, they're going to attack the weakest part. You want the weakest part of the wall to be near your house? No, you're going to make sure that's done well. Like, at least it may not look pretty, but it's going to be one of the strongest parts of the wall. Uh, it also makes lunch break really easy when you're just a five-minute walk from your house. Um, but personal interest can be leveraged to build up the kingdom of God. Um, God may put personal interests in your heart, uh, and, and it might just be because he wants to use that somewhere inside of his local church. But we just have to make sure that our underwater basket weaving uh, club that meets in the baptistry on Tuesdays is really being used to share the good news of Jesus Christ, okay? Eyes on the ball, you know what I mean? Um, what else did the builders do? All right, they encouraged the people who were next to them, and they were encouraged by the people who were next to them. 
something around 21 times the phrase next to, beyond, next to them uh, occurs in chapter 3 here. So which person, singular, was supposed to rebuild the wall? Well, that's a misleading question. There wasn't one person who was supposed to do this whole thing while everybody else just sat and watched them. Okay? Everybody was to be involved in this project. And this communal aspect of God's people relating with each other is given to us from the top down. God is Trinity. God the Father loves God the Son and cannot wait to just show him off to the world. And, and, and the Holy Spirit loves being used by God the Father and, and, or, and loves to uh, allow God the Son's work to be communicated to people. You see, there's so much love going on in the Trinity that God the Son came, took on human flesh, and died in our place so that we could know that love for eternity. The calling to follow Jesus is a call to the community of believers. The word church literally means gathering. Because if your sense of community is Sunday morning service between high and by, you're missing out on the joy of communing, committing together. Now, many of you here, I mean, COVID did a lot to just put a bomb in all of this and those who are here after it you're like you're here committing and serving and you're you're a part of the the different parts and pieces running uh and so many of you know the joy of what it means to serve next to him next to them and, and you you just you know you can pull a, a lot more weight when you're all pulling together than you can individually all on your own god designed it like that when god told moses you hold that staff up and Joshua will defeat, Joshua and the army is going to defeat the Amalekites. Well, how long can you hold a small log up for? It's not long before you start getting tired. And that's what happened to Moses. His arms got tired. Did God want Moses to be the superhero here? And what did Aaron and her do? Well, since Moses gets all the credit as the leader, I'm just going to sit back, run my mouth, and criticize if things don't go well. No, they said, Moses, we got a rock for you. Sit down, and we're going to hold your arms up so that God's kingdom can prevail. Jonathan's dad was King Saul. Jonathan had proven himself a capable leader. He was the rightful heir to the throne as the king's son, but God had anointed David as king. And does Jonathan hate David for it? No. 1 Samuel 23, he tells David, the Lord is with you, so I am with you. Jonathan was loyal to God's kingdom, not his own. He had his eye on the ball. So, why bother? Why bother with all of this? What, what does it matter that 2,500 years ago, a group of people rebuilt their city wall? Like, you want to build a wall at this church or something? Look, don't lose the forest for the trees, remember? This Jerusalem in the Old Testament points to a greater Jerusalem that we read about at the end of the New Testament in Revelation. What they saw were broken walls that needed to be rebuilt. What they saw was, was a, a city that was lying in ruins. And then they saw God's hand taking a bunch of people from one nation, uniting them around a common vision, you know, that's what unity does. It, it, it unites around something bigger than the individual. And they saw God work. They did not realize in the moment that this was a prelude. That Nehemiah 3 is a, a prelude to some, not from one nation, but some from all nations being brought into God's kingdom. Being built on the cornerstone 
that is Christ of the new Jerusalem. And in that process, they would be the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Your light is to shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Where does this light come from? It comes from Jesus being the king of your life. He's the light of the world. Nehemiah 2 is like 450 years or so before Jesus shows up. Uh, what did God's people say in Nehemiah 2? They said, let's rise up and build. In the New Testament, the darkness could not keep out the light who rose from the dead that the kingdom of God might be built. Why bother? I'll read you a page from uh, How to Build a Healthy Church by Mark Dever here. Why bother? Because eternally our work will withstand the fire of the last day only if we build with the gold, silver, precious stones specified on the biblical blueprint in 1 Corinthians 3. Building without that blueprint will virtually guarantee that we build with the cheaper and more abundant resources of wood, hay, straw, all of which will burn in the end. Ignoring God's plan for the church and replacing it with your own will ensure the eternal futility of your work. Here at the outset, then, it is critical to reflect biblically on this foundational question, what is a local church? Fundamentally, God intends the local church to be a corporate display of his glory and wisdom, both to unbelievers and to unseen spiritual powers. More specifically, we are a corporate dwelling place for God's spirit, the organic body of Christ in which he magnifies his glory. The Greek word for church is ekklesia, a gathering or congregation of people. The church is God's vehicle for displaying his glory to his creation. The uniqueness of the church is her message, the gospel. The church is the only institution entrusted by God with the message of repentance of sins and belief in Jesus Christ for forgiveness. The gospel is visualized in the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper, both instituted by Christ. The distinguishing marks of the church then are the right of preaching this gospel and the right administration of the biblical ordinances that dramatize it. The structure we're building then is fundamentally God-centered. It is a Godward structure designed to display the glories of God's character and the truth of his gospel. It is also an outward-looking structure, but even in the outwardness, it is God-centered. Since we look outward for the purpose of spreading God's character and gospel through all the nations to gather more worshipers for him and thus magnify his glory. This book is not about Nehemiah 3. I was just reading it this, uh, this week, and I'm like, wow, that's just right where we're at. I mean, can you see the beauty now of Nehemiah 3 as, as, as a picture of God's kingdom being built through the teamwork of the church? I know, like, just reading it by itself, you're like, whoa, like so-and-so built this, and so-and-so built this, and next to him built that. Like, but there's so much more going on here. Um, so as, as Ron and the praise team come up uh, to lead us in, in some response here, I want you to do some internal questioning here, all right? Is our involvement in the church about building up his kingdom? I mean, why aren't you out hiking or watching the Weather Channel or playing golf, or what motivates you to be here on a Sunday morning? You know, if our anthem is, oh, say, can you see how the church can serve me, then that's just the exalted ones of Tekoa, who are like forever in God's word, uh, reprimanded for being too high up to stoop to serve their Lord. Is there a hesitancy to be involved because, well, I didn't go to seminary. I didn't go to Bible college. I'm not, I'm not qualified for this. I, do you remember who was involved in this project? Not spiritually, but practically a bunch of unqualified people. Yet it worked. 
I, we're gonna go through the rest of Nehemiah, Lord willing, and they're gonna finish the wall. Uh, it works because they got off the bleachers, they got on the field and they kept their eyes on the ball. So, what ministry are you involved with at church? Who are you praying for? I mean, th that's a, a significant ministry. I need your prayers. Other people in this church, they need, they need your prayers. Who are you inviting to church? I mean, do you want the church to grow? Well, yes, but I'm not inviting anybody. <laughs> Say, come to church with me, Shively, 1030, Sunday morning, you can sit with me. I, there's, there's space in the pew next to me, you know? Can we just pray about inviting somebody to church this week? Well, I don't know if I can serve in the kingdom. I mean, women don't really build walls. Did God say that? Well, I can't share the gospel. I'm too... Did God say that? I'm not going to, you know, I can't invite people to church because there's things in my life. Did God say that? Feeling unqualified may be God's way of preparing you. What he did with, how is a cupbearer qualified to lead a wall building project? And the next step is to worship. Worship, like yes, we sing in worship, but worship by using those hands and feet. There's a VBS meeting happening in a few minutes, children's ministry on Wednesday nights, there's a coffee, ESL ministry, like it's, this stuff is not rocket science to figure out, I'm just saying. But this building project, it was an act of worship to God. So let me encourage you to know the joy of being on the team, of encouraging other people on the team and keeping your eyes on the ball. Pastors will be down front to respond with you as the Lord leads. Yeah. 
Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. something bigger than ourselves. Shout Jesus as you go. Amen. And you are dismissed.